you ask me to summarize in a single paragraph everything we have learned in the past half century that paragraph would be this we are persuaded by what has happened that every child born has at the instant of birth a greater potential intelligence than Leonardo da Vinci ever used. I use Leonardo because he's my favorite genius. I think there are we people and then a big space and the geniuses, another big space and Leonardo all by himself. And yet we are persuaded that every child born has a greater potential than he ever used. The process of education begins at six years of age, but the process of learning begins at birth. You can teach a baby absolutely anything that you can present to him in an honest and factual and joyous way. If you want the very best quotes about children and the genius which is inherent in children, you look for quotes from geniuses. Let's take Buckminster Fuller, for example. Bucky says that all children are born geniuses, and we spend the first six years of their lives degeniusing them. On behalf of the staff, I'd like to welcome you all to the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential. Uh, you are as welcome here as the flowers in May. You have been preceded by 40,000 parents. Here at the institutes, we have spent a half century of elapsed time studying the role of intelligence, studying what is intelligence, where did it come from, and what happens. Is it genetic or is it environmental? And we have studied this in terms of people from the beginning of man a million years ago in Australopithecus until now. We're the greatest anthropologists in the world. Uh, we have studied it most especially in tiny children from the day of birth on. We have lived in the Kalahari Desert with uh, bush children, watched them born and watched them develop. We have lived in the Xingu territory of Brazil with uh, what are certainly the most primitive people in the world and watched those babies born and develop. And we have watched it in the Arctic where the temperature is 55 below zero uh, and watched children be born and how they develop and what are the influences that make for high intelligence and, uh, and not. Everybody likes to think they're very good at doing things. I know how to do this. And certainly that's important. Uh, but may I suggest that you spend a special amount of attention listening to the why. Because if you learn only how, as you forget, your knowledge will get smaller. If you understand why you're doing what you're doing with your children, then uh, your knowledge will grow. Cousin, you that it's beautiful here to find a name. Doesn't it have a beautiful tail? What else would we call those feathers? Plumes. Plumes. The songbird in the school typified the active nature of vertebrates. There they are, two little active vertebrates. Songbird and the squirrel. Can clean mama, kill the spray with poison, and then the Sahara. The what? The Sahara. Right, there it is. Look at that green mamba. If you ask the average grown up uh, what three year old children are like, the chances are very good uh, that they'll say, oh, uh, well, they're fun loving little things who would rather play patty cake than anything else. That's nonsense. Kids would rather learn than anything else. But we give them a choice uh, to prove our point. We give them a choice between playing patty cake or solitary confinement in the playpen. And the kids pick um, patty cake. And we say, see, they love patty cake. 
It often occurs to me when some American diplomats were prisoners in a foreign country, they were handcuffed and blindfolded, uh, handcuffed to a chair so they couldn't move. I'm sure if you had said to them, would you rather play patty cake, they would all have said, yes, I'd rather play patty cake, take off the handcuffs and uh, take away the blindfold. But if we use that to prove that diplomats love nothing better than playing patty cake, we could see how silly that is. If you give a child his choice between patty cake and learning Greek, uh, with 100% reliability, he'll pick learning Greek. Why? What children want more than anything else is adult attention, um, full-time adult attention. And they would give anything to get that full-time adult attention. Um, when they, they get this choice, it's first choice, mommy. Second choice, daddy. Third choice, anybody who will pay attention to them because in paying attention to them, they learn. What the program did for, for our children was it, um, it made them, they seem to look at things more deeply. You know, they, they always take, take things one step further when they're, they're um, asking questions uh, about things. Uh, they, they're very talented, very intellectual, uh, but they, uh, they're very unassuming. You know, to meet them, they're, they're, they're normal kids. Uh, they sort of view their, their life as um, a learning laboratory. Daisy? Cactus? Bird of paradise? Orchids? Transverse baby? It's wet. It does have drops on it. A little bit of dew. That's right. Trans Transval daisy? That's not wet. That's right. That's right. That's right. And foxglove. Yeah. I've been able to have a very close relationship with them as a teacher, and sometimes we reverse roles. Sometimes they become the teacher, and uh, we have fun with that. We go back and forth with that. Um, along with um, this program allowing me to really know my children, um, and have fun learning with them. I learned a lot about myself as far as my ability uh, to be a sincere teacher for my own children, which I think is the key as to why it works. Japanese. Yes, Japanese. Han. Gomi Baku. Beto. Doke. Hashi. Denwa. Yeah. Of all the myths in the world, the very worst myths are the myths about mothers. They don't even have the virtue of being funny, as some myths do. Um, problem is that among professional people, there is an unspoken, unwritten law that says, in essence, that all mothers are idiots and there is no truth in them. The sadness about that is mothers know more about their babies than anybody in the world does. There's a real danger that mothers are going to be bullied out of their instincts by we professional people. Um, you know, mother reads an article in a journal by a PhD, very often a bachelor, who says, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. Um, you ought to beat him up every Tuesday whether he needs it or not. And mother thinks, that doesn't sound right to me, but I'm only a mother. And then she reads another article that says, never lay a finger on your child or he'll grow up to hit your guts. And mother says, that doesn't sound right either, but I'm only a mother. Um, I have an idea that any time a mother felt it would be a good idea to uh, lay one in the seat of the kid's pants um, or to pick him up and love him, she did so, that she'd be right 99% of the time. I don't think we professionals are right about anything 99% of the time. You know, mothers, without any help at all, have gotten us from the Australopithecine caves of a million years ago to now. Up until 200 years ago, there weren't any pediatricians or obstetricians uh, or child brain developmentalists. 
Uh, and she did it all by herself, and pretty good job. Here we are. You know, mothering was the first profession, not that other one, mothering. Some people have said of us, and they don't intend it as a compliment, all those people are doing is driving mothers and kids closer together. Well, that's not all we're doing by a long shot. But I must say, if somebody someday carves on my tombstone, he drove mothers and kids closer together, I'll rest well. Buta, buta, what do you call it? Hi, hi, buta. Okay. Inu, inu, what do you call it? Saru. Not Saru, inu. Da. Ye, ye. Which one? Ye. Hi, so there. Inu. Um, Saru, what do you call Saru. 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 There are certain single lines in this program which, if you really understand them, are worth the price of the program many times over. One of these lines is that function determines structure. And the second is that the brain grows by use. Everybody understands that in a physical context, in a muscular context. Everybody knows that if I pick up 25 pound weights over and over again, that I'll get big biceps. If you pick up 50 pounds over and over again, you'll get bigger biceps. Then you'll have two advantages over me. The first is you can lift twice as much as I can. Secondly, if we're both going to um, pick up an additional 25 pounds, um, I'll have to double my ability, and you won't. Now, neurophysiologists have understood this for a long time. Um, for instance, uh, one of the great, great teams a long, long time ago, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, at Berkeley were Kresh, Rosenzweig, and Diamond. Uh, here's what they did, very sane thing. They took uh, two groups of rats. They took one group of rats, actually, and divided them into two, uh, a litter of rats. Litter mates in this group, litter mates in this group. One was a control group, and the other was the functional group. One group of rats were raised in relative deprivation, environmental deprivation with very little to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. There are the five paths into the brain. Oh, they weren't in darkness or silence. The other rats, their littermate brothers and sisters, were raised in environmental enrichment with a great deal to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. After a very short time of this, at very young ages, these rats where their intelligence was measured. They were put in a maze with food at the other end. The rats which had been raised in environmental deprivation were not intelligent in the sense that they had great difficulty finding the food. Their littermate brothers and sisters raised in enrichment found the food very, very quickly. Then they actually examined the rats' brains. And in the rats' brains which had been raised in relative environmental deprivation, they had small, stupid, undeveloped brains. Their littermate brothers and sisters raised in environmental enrichment had large, highly intelligent, uh, highly functional brains. Um, you know, uh, science is not always wise, and wisdom is not always scientific. Um, David Crash, a true scientist, said, it would be scientifically unjustifiable to assume that because this is true in rats, it is also true in human beings. That's scientifically fine. Then he added great wisdom. He said, and it would be socially criminal to assume that this were not true in human beings. There are five pathways into human brains we can see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. During the first six years of life, 
the human brain grows at a tremendous rate. The tiny child takes in raw data faster than at any other time in his life. And the older he gets, the slower he takes it in. And that data, going through those five pathways, literally, physically grows the brain. Now, Dave and his group had a problem. They couldn't turn their rats into people, and therefore prove that what was true in rats was also true in people. We had a problem. We couldn't take our children, whose brains we grow at a huge rate, and cut their brains up and look at them. Finally, we met these two groups and fell into each other's arms. Everything that they couldn't prove, we could. And everything we couldn't prove, they could. Uh, the brain grows by use. And the younger you are, the faster it grows. They will suck up anything. They want, and if they want it, just give it to them. If you like doing it, if you're happy doing it, they will be happy receiving it. And if the child is not ready for it, don't give it to them. If they're ready for it, you have to take your cue from your baby and just be happy. For too long, we people have looked at genetics and environment as if these were prison cells from which we cannot escape. Uh, in point of fact, genetics and environment are the very springboards by which we leap into the future. The problem is we have looked at genes as if they were a family thing. Um, I'm a doman and therefore I'm confined to what the domans are. Um, I'm a smith and therefore I'm confined to what the smiths are. Uh, that's not true. You know, the idea that I'm confined to what my grandmother was is an interesting one. My grandfather mother was a, a sweet old farm lady. Uh, and um, the idea that I'm confined to what she was, intellectually or otherwise, is an offensive idea, and you know who would be the most offended by that idea? My grandmother. My grandmother spent her life arranging for her children to stand on her shoulders, to um, begin life where she left off. And then uh, my parents spent their lives arranging for me to stand on their shoulders. And I've spent my life arranging for my children to stand on my shoulders. And now they're in the process of arranging for my grandchildren to stand on their shoulders. That's what the human condition is. So, do family genes have nothing to do with it? Oh, sure. Uh, my family genes determine what color my eyes are, in general, how t short I am or how tall I am, such things as that. But they are nothing in the way of intellectual or even physical limitations. Do we then have no genetic gift? Oh, do we ever. We have a magnificent genetic gift. We are all gifted with the genes of Homo sapiens. What's that mean? Who's your favorite genius? Michelangelo, Beethoven, Shakespeare? Whoever your favorite genius is, you have the genes of that person. You have the genes of every genius who ever lived. You also have the genes of every villain who ever lived, as a matter of fact. Now, nobody ever saw an Irish gene or a German gene or an American gene or a genius gene. With the genes of Homo sapiens, an enriched environment, a human child can be anything that he and his family want him to be. We parents should settle for nothing less with the gift of the genes of Homo sapiens and an environment which we entirely control. We can make any child anything. Stephen is three now, and he was three months old when we started, and uh, that's when I found out about the program, and I was very excited because I took a look at him when he was, he was my first, and I knew even as an infant that he, he sort of wanted to do something. He started with the words and reading, and I added almost immediately the encyclopedia knowledge and the, uh, the math program. It stimulates his imagination and uh, he couldn't get enough books and uh, we had a hard time keeping up with his appetite and he likes all kinds of books. He liked books better literally than anything else that you could do in a day. 
including eating, sleeping, or uh, playing anything else. And uh, he he's kept that. And uh, it's it's very nice because now he'll pull a book down and he'll sit quietly and look at it himself. And at times he'll take it and he'll read it out loud. And he'll, sometimes he'll just sit in the corner and I'll hear him laughing, knowing that he's enjoying certain parts. And he'll incorporate a lot of the ideas into uh, his conversation or his observations. And uh, I know it's expanding his universe. The problem is that we adults are absolutely positive we're smarter than kids. That makes us endlessly arrogant about them. Surely it's true that at birth, a child has virtually no information and certainly no wisdom. Now, a fascinating thing happens then. His ability to take in information is better than it will ever be again in his life. And that curve every day falls off to take in information without effort. By six, it's just about gone. Wisdom, on the other hand, is the other way. He has no wisdom when he's born, and he very, very slowly gains wisdom. So that by six, he's just about um, those lines cross each other. Now, we adults are sure that the older you are, the easier it is to learn. That's not true. One-year-olds learn to uh, can learn a foreign language easier than a seven-year-old. One-year-olds uh, can learn to read much easier than a seven-year-old. One-year-olds learn mathematics much easier than a seven-year-old. Indeed, there is anything that a one-year-old can't learn quicker and easier uh, than a seven-year-old. It's why the first six years of life are so important. Tiger, can you make a tiger sound? Oh, and a monkey. <laughs> so the monkey says, and a giraffe has a long neck. And gorilla, just like Clyde, you have gorilla Clyde at home. And hop, are you hopping on just one foot, or you can jump, 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 and back to the beginning with cheetah. <laughs> yeah, very good. The staff of the institutes have spent perhaps 2,000 people years studying intelligence all over the world. We are finally persuaded that we understand the requirements for intelligence. And without these, it can't happen. The first requirement for human intelligence is the ability to take in facts. The second requirement is the ability to store these facts. The third requirement is the ability to retrieve the facts as useful knowledge. The fourth requirement is the ability to combine and permutate the facts in order to arrive at new facts and ideas. The fifth requirement is the ability to use the facts to solve problems of increasing importance. These things being true, parents now know precisely what to do in order to multiply their child's intelligence. The first is to provide a child with a huge number of clear facts. The second is that parents give these facts frequently to ensure their permanent storage. And third, to provide opportunity to retrieve stored facts as useful knowledge. Fourth, the parents know it is necessary to give the child sets of related facts so that he can combine and permutate them in the greatest number of useful ways. And fifth, to provide frequent opportunity to solve problems of increasing importance. It's as simple as that. This is when you went to Japan. This is a book about when you went to Japan. Nani shiteru no? Sanpo ni ikimasu. Sanpo ni ikimasu. Who is that? Matsuko. There's Aki and Mary and Shana. Icho no ha o mitsu mishita. Nani shituru no? Suvara dai 
で遊んでいます。すぼれだい。That's what that's called. 何してるのブランコに乗っています。They went down. 何してるのお、well, um, joined our family when she was five months old. We adopted her at that point, and that's when I first started showing her the encyclopedic knowledge and the bits with her. I think the most important thing is to enjoy what you're doing and have a lot of fun doing it. It's a, a way for you really to communicate with your child and have fun learning together. And、um, whatever stage they're at, that they're always changing. I found the most important thing to always. Watch is to be aware of the differences from day to day, not just from month to month as they go through different developmental stages and be flexible. Ready to do a lot one day when they want to and ready to do just a little bit one day when they're not really interested in their reading words that day. That day she might, they might want to be busy climbing on the sofa ten times that day and just let them do that on those days. I have a strong suspicion that if the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential are remembered. 200 years from now, it may not be for the many, many successful methods of growing children's brains that we have devised. I have an idea that it may be for the Institute's developmental profile. It is very important. In all fairness, I must say it's the good Lord's profile. He designed it a long, long time ago. At the most, we have been careful. Observers of tens of thousands of children、uh, in every culture in the world.、Um, at the best, I guess, we have been Boswells to Mother Nature.、Uh, the profile is a picture, actually, of how a child grows、uh, and why his brain grows as it does. There are six functions that characterize we human beings. Uh, that no other creature can perform. Three of them are motor functions, and three of them are sensory functions. Let's begin with the sensory functions. Only we human beings see in such a way as to read the languages that we have invented. Only human beings hear in such a way as to understand those languages through our ears. Only we human beings. Can hold an object in our hand and by feeling it alone, without seeing it or tasting it or smelling it, know what it is. Then there are the three motor functions. Only we human beings walk in an upright、uh, position and in a cross pattern. Only we human beings talk、uh, and speak those contrived, invented languages that we've invented. And finally, Only we human beings can take、uh, our thumb and oppose it to our forefinger and holding a pencil, write those languages which we have invented.、Um, these functions begin to happen、uh, in such a, a primitive way at birth, but they are complete by six years of age. There are Seven significant stages. These six things occur、uh, at birth,、uh, and then at two and a half months of age, and then at seven months of age, and then at 12 months of age, and then at 18 months of age, at three years of age, and they are complete in an average child by 72 months of age. The left side of the profile has to do with those three sensory columns. Those three columns, you remember, are the visual competence, the auditory competence, and the tactile competence. The right side of the profile has to do with the motor functions, which is to say mobility, language, and manual competence. Between those six columns,、uh, there is a human figure in profile. That human figure. Shows us the seven vital levels of the central nervous system. The colors、uh, they are in 
represent their responsibility, each brain level's responsibility on the profile. For instance, the bottom column, which is red, is how baby performs in those six areas at birth. Uh, the orange column describes a baby at two and a half months of age. The yellow column describes a baby's functions in those six areas at seven months of age. The green column describes the tiny child at one year of age and his functions. The blue column describes an 18-month-old and the functions that the child performs then. The indigo column represents three years of age and the functions uh, performed then and the brain level responsible. The violet column at the top of the profile represents the six-year-old and by this time in the average child these six functions are complete. The column on the far left um, represents uh, lists the levels of brain which are responsible for those functions. These functions are so well known that the world assumes they are controlled by oh, a sort of preset alarm clock that rings at these various ages and the kids do these things. Um, as an example, it rings at one year of age uh, and the child takes his first steps and says his first words. It rings at three years of age uh, and he's talking. Uh, it, rings, it rings at uh, six years of age and he is walking and running and reading and writing. This is not so. The best example of this is that visual column with learning to read at the top. It says, and it's true, that the average child in a civilized culture learns to do that by six years of age. However, the fact is that we know many two-year-old children, hundreds, who read at the eight-year-old level. Uh, and in Philadelphia, 40% of well 16-year-olds in high school can't read. It is simply not true that brain growth and development are a product of a preset alarm clock. Quite the reverse is the case. Brain growth and development are a product of stimulation and of opportunity. Brain growth, as a matter of fact, can be stopped, as it is, by brain injury, by severe brain injury. Brain growth can be slowed, as it is, by anything which creates a lack of stimulation and a lack of opportunity for the child. But most significantly, this is a process which can be speeded. We have taught parents how to speed this process in tens of thousands of children, directly and indirectly through books and our other work uh, with hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of children. Now on the profile, the second column from the left shows the early ages at which this can occur, the average age at which it occurs, and the late ages at which it occurs. In conclusion, all we do at the institutes is to provide visual, auditory, and tactile stimulation with increased frequency, intensity, and duration in recognition of the very orderly way in which the brain grows. As a matter of fact, we don't even do that. All we do at the institutes is to teach parents to provide visual, auditory, and tactile stimulation with increased frequency, intensity, and duration. The profile is a total guide for the parents. It, it lets them know precisely where their child is now. It lets them know precisely where the child has to go in each of those six functions and even how to go about it.
one of the most common questions that people ask is what's going to happen to these kids when they get to school what do you think will happen to them not only do they find their schoolwork to be easy and fun but they're able to do well in whatever they want to do they're often the natural leaders of the group because they are confident imaginative and happy these children are charming and delightful children they are among the kindest and best people I have ever known they are all full of the characteristics that make you love kids and lacking in the characteristics that can make children annoying and insensitive they combine all the best characteristics of children and grown-ups it must be obvious that we love kids if these kids grew up into nasty little smart Alex we would take everything we know type it out very carefully and eat it and there is the CPU the central processing unit that's the computer's brain and here we've got well I think reading helps me a lot because in school when there's like an assignment to read and then do questions I can read it a lot faster into the questions so I finish my homework quicker and um, I can I can understand the words more they're very close wonderful and happy moments that you have and you just want to do it more and more and more because you see what a good time you're having because they're having such a great time here is a here is a picture of a few should there. like a lot of different books like right now I'm reading some World War II books and I like to read books that tell about things and um, a little bit of adventure books they enjoy learning and they still enjoy learning and if for nothing else that is what early development did for me and for my kids it really gave them the the love of learning too many deaths on this road she thought I'm pilot major of a dead fleet one ship left out of five eight and twenty men from a crew of 107 not only ten I was six years old, old when I first read Shogun uh, I was basically addicted to that book I carried it around wherever I went um, people kept kept on asking me um, what book it was and isn't it really hard to read that um, it's mainly a very adult book I can't imagine um, how he grew um, without the program because I really did the program from the beginning at birth and then I was preparing so much before he was born um, but more and more after he was born. If you give them the choices what they want to be when they're younger, they'll go through the phases and then right after they're probably around when they've finished elementary school, they'll probably know what they want to do. And they've already just established that as a fact. And I want to do this, so therefore I'm going to either go to high school or skip high school and go to college. I've always loved math biology, math, science. Those are probably the biggest things that I want to study when I get older because I want to become a vet. Um, when I visited a veterinary clinic when I was eight, it, felt, it sort of felt really good watching those people help the animals um, in a way very sentimental. Kiss! I'll give you a big kiss. Kiss! And hug, hug, big hugs, big hugs. Mm. Yeah, very good. Okay, grab a hold both hands. All right, let's swing. Can you reach for the next rung? There you go. Okay, let's let go. Okay. This is a hammer. This is a screwdriver. And this is a paintbrush. Guess what? I have something here. What is this? <gasps> wow! You're right! It's the paintbrush! Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one! Those are the integers! Okay, let's make this sentence. Christopher Columbus was born in... Uh, 
Should we pick him out? Where do you think he was born? Would you like to figure out what country was he born in? Italy, right. Metacarpals. Where's our metacarpals? Right here. That's correct, right there. And do you want to use plus or minus again? Oh, minus. Minus again. Okay. No, well, plus. Plus? Okay, go get the plus. All right. If you're ever out with someone and you're eating and something gets lodged in your throat, you'll know what to do, how to save their life, okay? So you would stand up, if you see the person, and you would put your two hands like this. I'm not going to do it hard, because that will injure you now. And push up very hard, and the, the object will just expel right out of your mouth. And you will be a hero. You will save someone's life. Now, I've got some closing pieces of advice for you. The first is that everybody says you must be careful not to talk over a child's head never talk over their heads. Might I propose that you should always talk over their heads so that they go through life reaching up every moment of their lives. The alternative is talking down to them. Secondly, you should do exactly as much of this program as you're comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with it, don't do it at all. If you are comfortable, doing five minutes a day or ten minutes a day, then do that. And don't let anybody talk you into more. And if you're comfortable being a professional mother all day, every day, then do that. And don't let anybody talk you out of it. Finally, I'd like to say again, mothers are the best teachers the world has ever seen. And tiny children are the best learners the world has ever seen. Learning together generates joyousness and a natural respect between mothers and their children, which is precious indeed. If you have a great time teaching your child, and your child has a great time, there simply isn't any way you can lose.